Good evening. I'm Spot On Weather meteorologist Matthew Euler, and welcome to the How the Weather Works training series. This is part 13, and on part 13 of the How the Weather Works training series, I'm going to be covering tornadoes. A very fascinating storm indeed, and I'm going to delve right into a lot of information on tornadoes in tonight's video. So let's get right to it. All right, so first of all, the definition of a tornado. Uh, it is a rapidly rotating column of air that blows around a small area of intense low pressure. It's considered to be more of a wind around a tornado or associated with a tornado it is said to be cyclostrophic where there's significantly large pressure changes over very short distances. It has a circulation that generally reaches the ground and the pressure can be 100 millibars lower inside the tornado than actually outside of the tornado. Strong winds around a tightly curved radius, that generally refers to that cyclostrophic wind. We have very intense winds, a very significant drop in the barometric pressure within the tornado funnel itself. Now tornadoes, you probably have seen this, whether it be videos on social media or just posters or still images, pictures from people. Um, tornadoes can assume a variety of shapes, from a twisting rope shape to more of a massive black funnel. A funnel cloud, now I want to distinguish between tornado versus funnel cloud in tonight's training. A funnel cloud is an actual tornadic circulation, but here's the big difference. A funnel cloud has not reached the surface, okay? A tornado, that does reach a surface. This, the circulation gets all the way to the ground, whereas a funnel cloud does not. Now, the majority of tornadoes, they tend to rotate in a counterclockwise manner if we were looking at them from above. But there are actually been some cases, there are some cases in which the tornadoes actually can rotate the opposite way, clockwise, too. More facts about tornadoes. Uh, the diameter is generally between 300 and 2,000 feet. So... Tornadoes can be uh, very wide, and of course, the ones that stay on the ground the longest and the ones that are the widest usually do very big time, considerable amounts of damage. They tend to form a move more from the southwest to the northeast, ahead of advancing cold fronts, and they move very, very quickly at speeds from 20 to 40 knots. In fact, some tornadoes have moved as fast as 70 knots on the ground, and that's why when a tornado warning is issued, um, you need to take shelter immediately. Um, time is of the essence when these type of storms are moving. Now, most tornadoes are only going to last a few minutes with an average path length of generally four miles. Of course, there have been some very long path lengths. Look at that last bullet on this slide with some of the most destructive tornadoes. They've stayed on the ground for hundreds of kilometers and have persisted for many hours. A great example of that was the Tri-State Tornado of 1925. That covered a 292-mile path, remaining on the ground for seven hours. They call it Tri-State because it impacted the states of Missouri, Illinois, and Indiana, those three states. All right, so now let's move into a discussion on the various stages of a tornado. Just like with thunderstorms, you know, it goes through various stages. The first stage we'll talk about is what's known as a dust whirl stage. And this occurs when the dust is going to swirl upward from the surface, marking that tornadic circulation, that connection from the cloud to the ground. And in the dust whirl stage, the damage is normally light. Next, we move into the organizing stage of a tornado. This is where that tornado increases in intensity with an overall downward extent of the funnel is clearly visible at the organizing stage. Moving into the mature stage, this is when the damage is most significant, most severe, as the funnel reaches its greatest width and is almost aligned vertically at this point. Then on to the shrinking stage. With shrinking stage, it's characterized by an overall decrease in that funnel width, uh, increase in the overall funnel tilt, and a narrowing of the damage path. And then finally, we have the decaying stage. Now, the, the main distinction of the decaying stage is you'll see more of a rope shape. 
Here is the stages of a tornado, um, graphically or pictorially. Um, by the way, this graphic is courtesy of the University of Arizona, Department of Atmospheric Sciences. And what I'd like to do is go ahead and break out my laser pointer here. All right, so first thing we're going to talk about, again, is that dust swirl stage. So you notice in this particular stage how we don't have the, 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 the funnel itself is not completely visible touching the ground yet. But one of the very first clues that, and really tips us off about whether it's a tornado or not is you'll start seeing this dust or this dirt kicked up at the surface. You start seeing things perhaps being picked up by the strength of the funnel or the wind associated with it, um, like roofs uh, on houses or various structures or buildings. Um, you, in this case, though, the dust swirl stage, you start seeing that dust get kicked up. Okay? And that's when you know that circulation extends from that cloud base all the way to the ground. The second stage, pictorially here, the organizing stage, uh, notice now how the visible, the, the, the funnel was more visible all the way in contact with the ground. Um, you're getting more of that counterclockwise rotation if we were to look at the tornado from above. Extremely low pressure is indicated by this red L in the center of the funnel cloud itself. Moving on to the mature stage here at stage three, we have a very big and strong tornadic circulation. We have the widest, uh, the widest part of the storm at this stage, the greatest amount of width, um, and, and it's just a very devastating storm by this point at the mature stage. And then moving to the shrinking stage, notice how you see more of the tilt from the cloud base down to the ground. Um, also, the thunderstorm more, uh, will move away from the bottom of the tornado typically, so it starts to become more detached. And then finally, the decaying stage. And again, the big giveaway for the decaying stage is this rope-like appearance. Overall, how deadly are tornadoes? Uh, usually, they're associated with less than 100 fatalities per year on average. But this can easily be exceeded in just one day. In fact, some of the more major outbreaks have killed quite a few people in just one day. Now, 45% of all the fatalities generally occur in mobile homes. The deadliest tornadoes occur typically in families, and a family is just basically, it involves different tornadoes spawned by the same thunderstorm. Tornado families are the result of a single long-lived supercell thunderstorm. Now, we talked about supercell thunderstorms in the thunderstorm training section, or training video here in the How the Weather Works training series. So, please feel free to go back and take a look at that supercell thunderstorm structure. I do have some sl uh, slide coming up that's going to explain a little bit more about supercells again as a refresher, um, but um, Jeff, you definitely want to take a look at my thunderstorm video. Now, when six or more tornadoes form over a particular area, this constitutes an actual tornado outbreak. And speaking of tornado outbreaks, let's talk about a few that are very well known. Let's we'll start with the May 3rd, 1999 outbreak, uh, in which 78 tornadoes occurred across parts of Texas, Kansas, and Oklahoma. In fact, one tornado reached one mile in width, so it was one mile wide, with a measured wind speed at 318 miles per hour, just really, really destructive. Now, along a 40-mile path, the tornado damaged thousands of homes injured nearly 600 people and claimed 38 lives with over 1 billion in property damage. Just truly incredible damage. Another particular well-known outbreak occurred on April 3rd and 4th of 1974, and this occurred during a 16-hour period. During this 16-hour period, there were 148 tornadoes which moved through 13 states and it ended up killing 307 people. Remember what I said here? Um, tornadoes typically, uh, fatality-wise, less than 100 per year on average. How it can be exceeded in one day? Well, this is a prime example of a tornado outbreak that killed 307 people. That I mean, just in one uh, particular 16-hour period. And this outbreak also injured more than 6,000 people. And it resulted in an incredible and astounding $600 million in damage. The March 18, 1925, that was the tri-state tornado that I briefly talked about already. Um, but just think about this, 695 people were lost. 
Seven tornadoes traveled a total of 437 miles across Missouri, Illinois, and Indiana. <clears throat> Just really, really impressive. All right, so let's take a look at some of these tornadoes. All right, and I arranged them in order. These are actual images in the order in which I discussed on the tornado outbreak slide. So the first one here in the upper left, this shows you a tornado on the ground. This is associated with the May 3rd, 1999 tornado outbreak. Now this one was near Oklahoma City and notice how wide this tornado is, how wide the funnel is. It's completely in touching the ground at this point. You clearly see it um, and you notice how it just generally is going to protrude from what's known as a wall cloud. So the image here on the right, this one's going back to the um, April 3rd and 4th 1974 outbreak. Uh, again, notice the contact of the funnel with the ground. And there's a little bit of debris um, that's generally associated getting blown off some of these buildings. There's some houses here. Um, and you generally see some of the debris airborne at this point. And then there's the tri-state tornado here in the bottom. And in particular, one of these tornadoes traveled uh, that long stretch indicated by this blue line. Uh, it was over 600 miles. Um, and, and just look at this. It started in Missouri, and it's just incredible. It stayed on the ground, went through southern Illinois, and then headed across the state line to Indiana. Um, in general, you can't really see it here, but the town of Beale in Missouri, 100% destroyed. The town of Annapolis in Missouri, 90% destroyed. And then DeSoto, Illinois, 30% destroyed. Um, Griffin, Indiana, just the other side of the Illinois border, 100% destroyed. So just incredible amounts of damage during this particular tri-state tornado of 1925. Overall, now where do tornadoes occur overall? The climatology. Now there's no country in the world that really compares to the United States as far as the number of tornadoes. An annual average of over 1,000 tornadoes a year. The greatest number of tornadoes typically occurs in what's known as Tornado Alley of the Central Plains stretching from Texas all the way to Nebraska. Now there has been, interestingly enough, there has actually been a shift to the east in tornado frequency away from that typical tornado alley, uh, Texas, Oklahoma, Nebraska area. Um, over the past two decades, in fact, from the Central Plains all the way over to more of the area around Mississippi, Alabama. The Central Plains, by the way, everything just favors tornadoes. Um, this area is most susceptible due to the warm, humid air that comes in from the Gulf of Mexico. And that warm, moist, unstable air tends to be meet right along a uh, surface cold front. In addition, you have strong upper-level winds, which allow for that vertical wind shear, which is one of those key ingredients for supercell thunderstorms. And supercells can produce these tornadoes. So that strong vertical wind shear, very important, that cause the rotating thunderstorm updrafts, those mesocyclones. Now the highest frequency of tornadoes occurs usually during spring when you have the greatest temperature contrasts. Um, you know, one side of a front, you might have 75 to 80 degree Fahrenheit weather or temperatures. And on the cold side of that front, the temperature may drop an incredible amount by 30 to 40 degrees Fahrenheit. And it's just that clash of the cold, dry air from Canada and that warm, moist air from the Gulf of Mexico that really, really sets the tone. Now, three-fourths of all tornadoes are going to occur in the United States from March to July. The greatest number of tornadoes overall, however, occurs in the month of May. Uh, the most violent tornadoes occur in the month of April. And tornadoes are most frequent during the late afternoon hours, generally between 4 to 6 p.m., and they're least frequent in the early morning hours before sunrise. And why is that? Well, during the late afternoon hours, you generally have the greatest amount of atmospheric instability, um, you know, especially if you get the sun to come out um, from behind the clouds and heat the, the Earth's surface, resulting in that heated air at the surface is more buoyant, more positively buoyant, and wants to rise. After sunset, and right before sunrise, that's generally the time in which the atmosphere is most stable. Now, tornadoes can occur anywhere conditions are favorable. Uh, usually 36 tornadoes, uh, you know, we, we talk about many different locations, actually. 
Uh, for example, 36 tornadoes impacted the Carolinas in 1984, resulting in 59 fatalities. You know, and you wouldn't really think of the Carolinas as that tornado alley, right? But if the conditions are favorable, and I mentioned this in a previous video, where you use the acronym SLIM or SLIM, if you have shear, which is a change of wind direction and speed with height, if you have lift, and usually with um, the upper level, mid middle atmosphere, and low level areas of the atmosphere, you can get certain favorable areas of lift, and that could really set the stage. You have instability, in which warm, moist air is in the lower levels of the atmosphere, and you have colder air aloft, so you have greater instability. And then you have moisture, that's the M in SLIM. Uh, you have a lot of available moisture to, for these storms to tap into. During the winter time, the greatest frequency of tornadoes is generally over the southern Gulf states. Uh, when the polar front jet stream is much further south, it, it dips further south towards the Gulf of Mexico. And the temperature contrast, that temperature zone, where the greatest change of temperature occur, is further south as well. In the spring, what happens is you get the humid air from the Gulf of Mexico, starts to surge more northward, and you get contrasting air masses and temperatures. And that jet stream, that really provides that extra amount of shear aloft above the ground. Whether that's speed shear or directional shear or both, uh, that's going to result in a lot of helicity and a lot of turning and spinning of those updrafts. And in summertime, the temperature contrast generally is going to decrease from the lower latitudes and the higher latitudes, uh, but you can still get the polar front jet stream, which retreats further to the north along that U.S.-Canadian border, and you generally get with tornado activity more concentrated from the northern plains to New England. So as the year progresses from spring to summer, um, generally the tornado frequency also moves to the north, closer to the um, U.S.-Canadian border where that jet stream resides and where you get greater um, atmospheric dynamics. Here is a look at different months showing uh, the April tornado touchdowns in the upper left, um, showing you the July tornado touchdowns in the upper right, and then at the bottom I have December tornado touchdowns. Now, where you see the maroon coloring, the darker maroon coloring, that is indicative of a greater frequency of tornado touchdowns. Frequency of tornado touchdown shifts further south, closer to the Gulf of Mexico, where you have greater um, temperature contrasts again, where the polar front jet stream tends uh, coloring here, this pinkish coloring or salmon coloring. You notice almost everywhere in southern Canada, down in the U.S., outside the mountainous areas there in the western U.S. Also in Europe, you see a lot of, uh, you can also see tornadoes occur, uh, as well as parts of uh, South America and the southern tip of Africa and Australia, the east coast of Australia, the west coast of Australia, and then parts of Asia as well. Eastern parts of China can see tornadoes as well. Here is a chart on the right of the United States showing maximum tornado probability between the years 2002 and 2021. The purple shading indicates 40, this, this darker purple shading here, this um, results in about 35% of tornado probability. And so you see the purple shading across parts of Missouri, Illinois, Indiana, along the Ohio River into parts of Kentucky. Um, down to the south here, now this is what I was talking about. Um, this is an area that's known as Dixie Alley, by the way. We talk about Mississippi, Alabama, and Georgia. Um, look at the increase in probability here. Um, 
impressive there over parts of northeastern Mississippi, northwestern Alabama, and parts of southern or southwestern Tennessee. And there's another higher frequency area out towards eastern Nebraska down through central Kansas and central Oklahoma, Oklahoma City included. And so anything in the purple here general ha generally has a greater than 30% probability of seeing some type of tornadoes. And it even extends up into parts of North Carolina and southern Virginia. Now notice where the frequency drops off dramatically. The light, this green coloring here indicates a 2% maximum tornado probability. Look at the west coast. A lot of the west coast just doesn't see many tornadoes because they tend to be on the stable side of the eastern Pacific high pressure system. They tend to have a colder ocean current right off the west coast. And when the prevailing winds blow over that cooler ocean current, it tends to stabilize the air. And so you don't see a lot of tornadoes in parts of Washington State, Oregon, or California. Tornadic winds in general. Now, of course, the strong winds are the big deal here. They can destroy buildings, uproot trees. Tornadic winds have done some very interesting things. For example, they can easily lift a freight train. Uh, they've been known to suck toads and frogs from the Earth's surface and then deposit them elsewhere. Strip chickens of their feathers. Pieces of straw have actually been driven into metal pipes. So these are just some of the unusual things that can result from tornado, tornadic winds. The Doppler radar, that's the greatest tool we have because it provides more accurate wind measurements today showing those uh, velocity profiles on the Doppler radar. Now when a tornado approaches from the southwest, its strongest winds, by the way, are on its southeast side because you take into account that forward motion plus the rotational speed. So for example, a tornado moving to the northeast at 50 knots plus 100 knot rotational speeds yields 150 knot winds on that southeastern side. So if you're on the southeastern side, of a tornado as it moves from the southwest to the northeast, um, the forward motion plus the rotational speed, <clears throat> that could really, really be a double whammy and result in some of the strongest winds associated with the tornado. Another interesting topic, and I kind of mentioned this briefly, um, Dr. Ted Fujita discovered that there's multiple what are known as suction vortices that tend to rotate around the main center of the tornado. So you can have one main tornado here at the center of this counterclockwise circulation. Um, and then you can have these little mini tornadoes, I like to call them mini tornadoes, or mini suction vortices that will spin and they basically rotate around the main tornado at the center. Now these suction vortices can do a lot of damage. In fact, these dark gray areas on this diagram indicate where the suction swath or band of debris is deposited. So anywhere where there's a gray shading here, um, that's caused by these suction vortices. And they're generally associated with violent tornadoes with wind speeds exceeding 180 knots. The suction vortices are smaller whirls that rotate within the larger whirls, and they're only about 30 feet in diameter. Not very wide at all. Here's an example of suction vortices actually taken by um, some uh, storm chasers. You notice a lighter shading here that generally indicates uh, where these suction vortices are. Now I don't really see where the main tornado is in this particular example. It possibly could be over here, um, kind of embedded within this darker coloring. Um, but this is an example of that lighter shading in the bottom right graphic or image here. That's your suction vortices. And mention this a little bit. In the last uh, meteorology history series on Dr. Ted Fujita, Mr. Tornado, uh, in the late 1960s, Dr. Fujita proposed what was known as the original Fujita scale for classifying tornadoes uh, based on the rotational speed as well as the subsequent damage. He did a lot of research, of course, flying in, in the planes overhead uh, in the aftermath of tornadoes, just looking and taking notes and studying the damage patterns. And that Fujita scale range from F0 to F5, F0 being the weakest and F5 being the strongest tornadoes. And then in February 1st, 2007, to better reflect the examinations of tornado damage surveys that the National Weather Service was doing out in the field, uh, aligning wind speeds more closely with associated storm damage, um, they came up with an enhanced Fujita scale, an EF scale. So Fujita's name remains within the scale 
It's just now we're, we're, we're looking at tornado damage surveys, aligning wind speeds with that storm damage. And here is the EF, uh, the overall EF enhanced Fujita scale here in the bottom left. And it goes from a rating of EF0 with 65 to 85 mile per hour winds all the way down to the EF5, the most severe out of all the tornadoes, over 200 mile per hour wind speeds. Now, keep in mind that the majority of tornadoes that occur are generally considered weak, ranging from EF0 to EF1. So generally in that range between 65 and 110 miles per hour, that's where the majority of the tornadoes fall. Now, there have been some really interesting cases in the past where, you know, you might get an EF4, uh, EF, strong EF3, EF4, even EF5s. And I'm thinking about Mayfield, Kentucky last year in the month of December. Uh, that was a very intense storm, a very intense tornado. It did all that damage. Favorable tornado conditions? Let's turn our attention to that. Now, during spring, you get larger temperature or thermal contrasts. You get stronger upper-level winds associated with that polar front jet stream. And that is a great ingredient because you have that, that strong thermal contrast at the surface. And with the upper-level winds being strong aloft, that tends to lead to increased vertical wind shear. Uh, wind speed changes with height, drastic wind speed changes with height from the surface aloft, or um, directional uh, turning of the wind with height. Now at the surface, usually what you'll have is this open wave mid-latitude cyclone or this low pressure area with cold dry air moving in behind a strong cold front. And then you'll have a warm moist air pushing out ahead of that cold front moving northward from the Gulf of Mexico. And above that warm, moist surface, you get a wedge of colder, drier air and moving in a loft above it. So cold, dry air over warm, moist air is an extremely unstable situation in the atmosphere. The warm, moist air is going to want to rise because it's lighter and less dense. The colder, drier air is going to want to try to sink from a loft. And typically at 500 millibars or about 18,000 feet above our head, we get a trough of low pressure which exists to the west of this surface cyclone or low pressure with the polar front jet stream overhead at 300 millibars or 30,000 feet. And that jet stream, the favorable areas within that jet stream known as jet streaks or jet maxes tend to provide additional upper level divergence or removal of mass aloft, more accelerated vertical motion, and you can get some really intense thunderstorms to develop. A favorable upper level sounding it includes warm, moist air in the lower levels of the atmosphere with cold, dry air aloft. The turning of the increasing wind speeds with height promotes both directional and speed wind shear between the layers in the atmosphere above the ground. And in some cases, you can get what's known as an inversion. An inversion is an area in the atmosphere where the temperature actually increases with height. Now, an inversion acts as a stable lid on thunderstorm development initially, but once you get enough momentum, the surface is heated, that warm moist air wants to rise vertically, that increased momentum eventually punches through the inversion or that cap. And once that happens, you can get extremely strong updrafts. Uh, that caps are moved, explosive updrafts, potential supercell thunderstorm development, and cold dry air moving in over warm moist air is going to promote that greatest instability. Here is an example of favorable tornado conditions. I just wanted to show you a, a particular map here on the left. Anywhere within this um, maroon or red shading indicates a potential for tornadoes on this particular day from Dallas up to Kansas City to Chicago. Um, generally what we have is warm and moist humid air coming in from the Gulf of Mexico. It's moving northward. Uh, there's a surface cold front, by the way, also situated back in the eastern Iowa parts of northwestern Missouri, um, as well as eastern Kansas and central Oklahoma. We have unseasonably cold, unseasonably cold air moving down into the base of a long wave trough. This is our jet stream location, by the way, these this thicker gray arrows. So we got a lot of turning of wind with height, some speed shear, drastic changes from the surface to higher up in the atmosphere, large temperature contrast to the surface, and you're setting the stage or favorable conditions for tornadoes over a fairly large area on this day. Here's an example of a sounding. I'm generally showing you um, the, the um, line here on the right is your temperature profile and we go as we go in the vertical with height. The solid line on the left is your dew point. 
amount of moisture in the atmosphere. And initially you get a inversion or that cap that develops around 850 millibars or 5,000 feet. But once you heat the surface, this, um, this air beneath this cap or this inversion is going to continue to want to rise vertically and eventually it's going to punch through that cap or lid, that inversion, and it's going to result in, uh, see this cold dry air aloft. We got cold dry air aloft over a warm moist surface and that's what this sounding is showing. Um, the further apart these lines are by the way, the drier the atmosphere. The farther this goes to the left, the um, colder the atmosphere. So cold and dry air aloft in the middle levels of the atmosphere, like 500 millibars in the sounding or 18,000 feet, warm moist air at the surface, it's a recipe for tornadic conditions and severe thunderstorms. Now for supercell thunderstorms, I just want to kind of briefly refresh your memory on these. Um, they generally have rotating updrafts and they can exist for hours. They, they don't just go away when the sun goes down. Um, normal air mass thunderstorms do that. They pop up during the maximum heating time of the day, late afternoon, early evening, and then after the sun goes down, air mass thunderstorms dissipate. They lose the energy source of the sun. Supercell thunderstorms are more dynamically driven uh, with that position of the polar front jet stream, the increased vertical wind shear with height, uh, with a, a surface cyclone or low pressure system uh, that has a cold front and a warm front. A lot more dynamics, mid-level energy at 18,000 feet in the form of a shortwave trough. That's supercell thunderstorms. They form in a region where you have that strong vertical wind shear with wind speed increasing with height, along with the wind directional changes with height. And typically what you get with supercell thunderstorm development is you get southerly winds at the surface, and those southerly winds then become westerly winds aloft, say at 10,000 feet. So you've got a turning of the wind with height. The differences in the wind speed and direction between these vertical levels results in these rotating updrafts. The rotation starts initially in the horizontal axis, and then once a strong updraft takes that horizontally spinning tube, it lifts it in the vertical and a tornado may result. So with supercell tornadoes, now updrafts within a supercell, by the way, can reach speeds in excess of 90 knots. Increasing wind speed due to that speed shear with height can actually tilt the updraft. And that's one other big difference of a thunderstorm, an air mass thunderstorm, uh, and a supercell thunderstorm. A supercell thunderstorm has actual tilting of the updraft with height. So you keep the upper portion of the updraft downwind of the lower portion, and that tends to keep all the precipitation away from the updraft core. Now, why is that important? In a normal air mass thunderstorm, all that rain and precipitation tends to dry cooler air down from aloft and choke off the updraft. But with a supercell thunderstorm, with that tilted updraft, the precipitation is downwind, uh, the downwind of the um, supercell. Supercell thunderstorms can also contain large hail. This is very frequent, in fact, to get hail on the order of one inch in diameter or larger. Do these very strong updrafts. Now, what do this, why are those strong updrafts so important? Is because they keep hailstones in the cloud longer and continue the hailstone growth longer as compared to regular thunderstorms. And then looking at Doppler radar, precipitation swirling around a mesocyclone, it generally has a higher reflectivity as compared to areas inside the mesocyclone itself, which by the way is nearly void of precipitation. The region inside the thunderstorm where the Doppler radar is unable to detect precipitation, this is known as beware the bounded weak echo region. And you could get a hook shape uh, that may show up. That indicates a, what's known as a tornadic vortex signature, a TVS, as precipitation is drawn into the cyclonic circulation around the mesocyclone. And that updraft, with the updraft, you get counterclockwise swirling precipitation wrapping around the updraft, and that may all interact to produce what's known as a rear flank downdraft, or RFD, part of a supercell. When this downdraft strikes the ground, it tends to interact with the region of surface inflow beneath the mesocyclone to pr produce that area where the tornado actually occurs. I think I got a diagram coming up here. Yeah, 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 I do. Okay, so I'll tell you about that here in a minute. I'll kind of show it to you graphically. So 
Hopefully that makes more sense. Now as air rushes into the low pressure core of the mesocyclone, that rotating updraft, the air tends to expand, cool, and if sufficiently moist, <clears throat> condenses into a visible cloud, and that's that funnel cloud. And at the same time, the mesocyclone will stretch vertically and shrink horizontally with the spinning air accelerating upward. <clears throat> As the air beneath the funnel cloud is drawn to its core, the air cools rapidly and condenses, and the funnel cloud will then descend toward the surface. And by the way, the color of a tornado, it varies. Depends on really what it's picking up from the surface. There's been red tornadoes. Um, as you go down to the southern U.S., the, the soil is more, uh, more of a rusty red color. Um, so there's, there's darker funnel clouds or darker tornadoes. <laughs> if it's picking up darker dirt. Um, so it can be a variety of different colors, depending on the debris it picks up. <laughs> now the first sign that a supercell is about to produce a tornado is rotating clouds at the base of the storm. And that's usually what storm ch chasers are looking for. <clears throat> if the area of rotating clouds lowers, it's what's known as a wall cloud. Now, the funnel usually extends toward the ground from the wall cloud itself. Uh, occasionally, the funnel cloud cannot be seen due to falling rain, dust, or darkness. That's what makes tornadoes so dangerous um, when you get heavy precipitation supercells and if you get a, a tornado, um, the rain is falling so heavily and the visibility is reduced, you can't really even see where the tornado is. So that can be quite scary. Additionally, at night, you know, tornadoes can be very dangerous at night because unless you see lightning, you know, light the sky up, it's going to be hard to determine where that tornado actually is. Tornadoes have a distinctive roar, by the way, that many describe as, as a freight train sound. And it can be heard for several kilometers. But one big thing I want to make mention of is not all supercells will produce a tornado. Here's a nice picture of a lowering wall cloud, by the way. Um, generally, this area that looks very circular in shape, this very well could be the mesocyclone developing. Um, but in general, the wall cloud is typically where the tornado is going to drop down out of. Here is that supercell structure I mentioned. This photo is courtesy of Emma Weissman. Um, generally, what we're looking at is you have um, an anvil. Now, remember that the anvil generally points in the direction from which the upper level winds are blowing. So, in this case, the anvil is stretched in the upper levels of the supercell storm toward the right. It's stretching toward the right. That, that means my upper level winds are blowing from left to right here. In some cases, you can get extreme thunderstorm development where you get overshooting tops, which punch through into the lower stratosphere. And in this case, we have these penetrating or overshooting tops. And now, mammatus clouds, mamma. These are those pouch-like, utter-looking clouds that are associated with severe thunderstorms. Um, they kind of look like um, cow udders or um, egg shapes sometimes. That's on the leading edge, just beneath the anvil, the mammatus clouds. And then as we go from right to left, watch what happens here. Look at, look at what's going on here. Um, so initially, you might get virga, in which the rain is evaporating into the air, not reaching the surface. But as the storm moves, typically from southwest to northeast, you end up getting into light rain, moderate rain, and heavy rain. And then you end up getting into an area of small than larger hail, right in this location. Um, and, and, you know, when you go from, like, heavy rain, the sequence from heavy rain to large hail, um, you definitely have, most likely, a supercell. Uh, again, most supercells produce, you know, greater than one inch diameter hail. Then you get what's known as a tail cloud, and then you get the wall cloud. And then that tornado is going to drop down from the wall cloud, and that's where it's going to be. And then there's also, as I mentioned in my thunderstorm video, training video, I mentioned about what a shelf cloud was. See the shelf cloud back behind the wall cloud. All right, so there's a lot of different moving parts when it comes to supercells. And typically you're going to see more, more of a tilted updraft. And this precip is going to be um, not really choking that updraft off. And it's going to allow this storm to build to great vertical heights. And uh, if the conditions are right, sheer lift and stability and moisture, uh, we could see that wall cloud and tornado. 
All right, that wraps up the training tonight on tornadoes. We covered a lot. Um, hopefully, you learned something tonight from the video. This was, by the way, How the Weather Works Part 13 on tornadoes. Um, in this case, by the way, on the opening slide, you see this gentleman here, probably a storm chaser. He does have some instrumentation on the roof of this truck, and he's probably doing some uh, recording of this particular tornado that occurred in Oklahoma. And so what we covered tonight in review, we covered the definition of a tornado. It's simply a rapidly rotating column of air that blows around a small area of intense low pressure with a smaller scale cyclostrophic wind or, or circulation that reaches the ground. Um, tightly curved radius. Pressure can be 100 millibars lower inside the tornado, which is just incredible. You know, they used to say, um, as part of the safety tips, open up all your windows to equalize the pressure from inside a house to outside the lower pressure from the tornado. Uh, it really doesn't matter. Um, you know, it's, it, it's not really a, a wise thing to do anymore because they determine that pressure difference is so great. Even opening up the windows is not going to alleviate that. And it's always best to take cover and safety. Tornadoes can take on a variety of shapes. We talked about twisting ropes to massive black funnels. And the other big thing is a funnel cloud. The difference between a funnel cloud and a tornado, a funnel cloud does not reach the surface. A tornado does. Additionally, we talked about some more facts about tornadoes. Um, we also talked about the stages of a tornado, from the dust whirl stage uh, to the mature stage where the damage is most severe and the funnel reaches its greatest width, its, its, its widest points. And then it goes all the way to the decaying stage where you see more of a rope a very narrow rope shape. Here was the examples of the diagrams pictorially from the University of Arizona Atmospheric Sciences. And then we talked about some of the facts about tornadoes, uh, less than 100 fatalities per year on average. Um, unfortunately, most of these fatalities, about almost 50%, occur in mobile homes, the more susceptible areas. Talked about well-known tornado outbreaks from the May 3rd, 1999 tornadoes, 78 tornadoes. Uh, to the April 3rd and 4th, 1974 outbreak, 148 tornadoes, 13 states, and then the Tri-State Tornado on March 18th, 1925, almost 700 people were killed. Here were some of those images and graphics associated with those outbreaks. And then I talked about tornado climatology. Uh, generally, um, tornado alleys considered the central plains from Texas and Nebraska. Uh, but there has been a recent shift in the past couple decades towards the east, towards places like Mississippi and Alabama. <coughs> um, overall, a cold, dry air clashing with warm, moist air. Um, that's generally the great recipe for um, severe thunderstorms to develop and potentially tornadoes. Um, Three-fourths of all tornadoes are going to occur in the U.S. from March to July. Um, in general... Tornado climatology during the different times of year. We'll talk a little bit about that. And I showed these graphics to show you how in April during the spring, the tornado frequency, touchdown frequency is greatest in Texas, Oklahoma, and, and Kansas. As we go to July in the summer months, that shifts further north with that polar front jet stream position further to the north along the U.S.-Canadian border. And then in December, it, that frequency or probability of tornado touchdown shifts further south on the Gulf Coast. Looked at the world, distribution of tornadoes occurs over quite a few countries of the world. And then we looked at the max tornado probability for the United States. Talked about some of the tornadic winds and the, the, the interesting things they can do. The suction vortices, how they rotate around the main tornado vortex and can produce considerable damage. And then we talked about how we measure intensity of tornadoes through the enhanced Fujita scale, the EF scale. And the majority of tornadoes, again, are weak, generally in the range of EF0 to EF1. The favorable tornado conditions, went over that, covered the different um, synoptic um, situation where you get um, large temperature contrasts over short distances, typically in the horizontal, so significant temperature changes across typically a strong cold front, cold dry air aloft over a warm moist air mass, and in the middle levels of the atmosphere, you get that shortwave trough to the west of the surface low and a polar front jet stream overhead at 30,000 feet or 300 millibars. Talked about inversions and caps. Uh, what we're looking for is that momentum 
that updrafts, instability, just punch through that lid or inversion can, can result in explosive updrafts. Um, it showed you what that would look like in a typical map, favorable conditions. And then also on an upper air sounding, um, balloons are launched twice a day. I'm generally showing you how the temperature and dew point profile look with height with a favorable pronatic conditions. Talked again about supercell thunderstorms, um, supercell tornadoes associated with those, well, tornadoes associated with supercell thunderstorms. And then we also talked about uh, various um, areas such as the bounded weak echo region, beware, the TVS, rear flank downdraft, and so on. Uh, and then we moved on to um, the actual diagram here at the end for supercell structure. Big thing with supercell thunderstorms again is they have tilted updrafts and the precipitation does not choke off that updraft. All right, that wraps things up tonight on spot on weather, how the weather works training. We covered tornadoes. There's a lot of information tonight. Um, really hope again you enjoyed the video. I have a couple other topics to cover in the how the weather works training series, <clears throat> including high latitude weather as well as climate. Um, the important considerations of the average weather for a location known as climate. Um, additional news I have to share is that we'll be starting up more of the forecasting aspects, forecasting videos, as we get towards September. We're working our way now closer to mid-August, and um, you know, September starts up a whole new realm as far as frontal passages and um, changeable air masses. Uh, it, so we're looking, really looking forward to going back to some of the more um, weather forecast videos coming up starting in September. All right. We hope you certainly enjoy the program and content on the Spot on Weather YouTube channel. Thank you for your subscription. And I am signing off for now. Until next time, everybody, take care and God bless everyone.